Hi, I'm Michelle Shelfont, psychotherapist, holistic life coach, and human, just like you, learning to navigate life's challenges. With over 25 years experience, I teach people how to get healthy using the adult chair model. The adult chair model is where simple psychology meets grounded spirituality, and it teaches us how to become healthy adults. From anxiety and depression to codependency and relationship issues, you can use the adult chair for just about anything. Each week, I share practical tips, tools, and advice from myself and a wide range of experts on how to get unstuck, how to live authentically, and how to truly love yourself all while sitting in your adult chair. Welcome to the Adult Chair Podcast. Hello, everybody, and welcome to the Adult Chair Podcast. I am Michelle Shelfont. Delighted to be here with you today and the one and only Dr. Stan Tatkin. Yep, he is in the house. Relationship guru. Let me just tell you, if you have any questions about relationships, he's the guy. In fact, anybody that is in a relationship needs to run out and get his books. Specifically, I'm telling you, we had him on last year talking all about Wired for Love. I think that is like a relationship Bible. Everyone should have that book because it really just lays out key concepts to have a successful relationship. But now he's got a new book out. It is called In Each Other's Care. And he goes over very specific relationship conflicts that we all have and then how you overcome them. How do you work through them? So we're talking about that book today and even touched on Wired for Love. So, so much in today's show. If you are in a relationship or thinking about having one, you are going to want to hear the show today because we got into it. We talked about attachment. We talked about how do you repair relationships. We talked about secure functioning, all the things. Like, just listen. (laughs) You're going to love it. So I hope you guys had a wonderful May. Can you believe we're at the end of May already? I am actually this whole week in Tennessee doing the adult chair coaching certification program again. Yep, we are doing two a year. So if you are thinking about, hmm, maybe hiring a coach. We've got them. Head over to theadultchair.com forward slash coach. Check out all of our incredible adult chair coaches. They're all right there on my website. So let me tell you a little bit more about Dr. Stan Tadkin in case you do not know him. He is a clinician, author, researcher, PACT developer, and co-founder of the PACT Institute. Dr. Tadkin is, is an assistant clinical professor at UCLA David Geffen School of Medicine. He maintains a private practice in Southern California and leads packed programs in the U.S. and internationally. He is the author of We Do, Wired for Love, Your Brain on Love, Relationship Rx, Wired for Dating, and so many more. He's got a lot of great books, let me just tell you. So I look forward to you guys hearing this interview. We had such a great conversation. Here we go with the one and only Dr. Stan Tatkin. So welcome to the Adult Share Podcast, Dr. Stan Tatkin. Hi, Michelle. How are you? Oh my gosh. I am. I'm really great. How are you? I'm good. Okay, good. (laughs) Good. I am... um, I just want to say, I want to start out by saying thank you to you for writing this book. And and again, you do such beautiful work in the world itself, but thank you for writing this book. It is called, for those of you watching on YouTube, In Each Other's Care. It is is phenomenal. Um, What I love about this book, and I'm sorry, let me say the whole title, In Each Other's Care, A Guide to the Most Common Relationship Conflicts and how to work through them. What I love about this is it's like short, sweet, little, like some of it's not just like a half a page, right? Of questions that every couple has, right? Now, again, not every single couple, but very, I mean, these are such common, I'm going to give a couple of them or a few of them. What do you do when your kids are sleeping in your bed? 
My partner is a sex addict. I need to socialize, but my partner doesn't want to. Uh, we never make decisions together. Like these are, I mean, in my own private practice of over 20 years, when I did work with couples, common. I mean, so, and but everything in here is this a whole book is on these beautiful questions that as couples, I know, and you being a master with couples that they probably asked you, is it over like how many years is this, has, have these couples been asking you these, these questions like forever, right? They're so right. common. Yeah. So beautiful. Yeah. So what made you write this book based on, um, really complaints <laughs> by couples? I, you know, um, there is a backstory to this, but rather than give you the whole backstory, I, I, I really, I, I, I wanted to do something new and, and what I did was actually fun to write. Mm -hmm. I thought, okay, um, I, there, I get all these complaints that are similar. Mm -hmm. And because my, my recent obsession really has been, um, you know, couple organization, mm -hmm. couple organization and, uh, and the manner in which people speak when under stress. Uh, th those were the two things lately that I've I've come to think, the two big areas why unions dissolve, why they don't work. Mm -hmm. and, <clears throat> and one of them has to do with the, the lack of partners co-creating a culture of their own, a co-creating uh, the architecture of their relationship which is what any other union would likely do. It, 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 maybe not well, but they would know to do that, right? To mm -hmm. have a, sh a shared purpose, a shared yeah. and a reason for being. Uh, uh, where are we going, right? And other unions, other alliances or businesses or, you know, a, a rock band, <laughs> uh, a dance troupe, uh, uh, you know, anybody who unionizes because they want to do the same thing and they see it the same way. Mm -hmm. They have the same uh, vision or goal in mind, uh, uh, you know, is a necessary condition for people getting on board. Uh, and so for some reason, couples don't do that. They just don't. And the second, which is just as big reason why relationships will dissolve eventually. And when I say maybe not dissolve, but I'm interested in longevity and happiness, not mm -hmm. just longevity. Mm -hmm. uh, so, so the other reason is the manner in which all of us will interact when one or both of us is under stress. And this has to do with, uh, with threat, with whether we experience, uh, you know, some modicum of threat where our brain changes and, and we start to, on some level, believe that the other person is not an ally mm. uh is the enemy and so those it's, almost, are the, it's like yeah. real or perceived threat right real or perceived doesn't yeah. matter yeah yeah it doesn't matter it's uh, uh, you know we we we're scanning constantly for anything that would threaten our survival that's mm -hmm. nature that's supposed to do that but it gets in the way it gets in the way of relationships yeah. because we can accrue a lot of memory based on our whole experience, based on our earliest memories, even, and um, and again, couple relationships are the only ones that do this. The only ones that have this memory and have this uh, this issue of uh, of you know automating each other, taking each other for granted, not having a structure, not knowing what to do when they start to get aroused or start to to feel stressed and then talking in a manner that is threatening to the other person mm. and that's what the book is really it's yeah. it's it's a repetition of saying no you know no structure this couple doesn't have one they don't have agreements they don't have permission to enforce uh, mm. they don't have any social contracts mm. uh, made uh, and then the manner in which people will interact, which is why I uh, it, everything is uh, is also gone over in terms of narrative, how people will go back and forth and get themselves in trouble. I'm just thinking of this because I, I have a company. And do you find that even in a company, like, do you ever do corporate consulting? <laughs> because I have, yes. goodness <laughs> gracious, like I'm just sitting here thinking about like even in business, you know, I have 
I've worked with so many clients over the years. They're like, I can't stand my boss or my boss triggers me all the time or my boss gets triggered by me or my coworkers trigger me. It's all about relationships. It's all about relationships. Yeah. Everything is about relationships and yeah. how we navigate our way in those relationships. So no matter who we are, but I know that this book is about couples. So, but you just got me thinking about, wow, like even in a company, you know, we get, yeah. we all get triggered or, you know, someone's pushing my buttons because of my own wounding. But right. anyway, yeah. Interesting. And in, and in families too, uh, this, yeah. you know, a lot of this comes from Ivan Bozer, many Naj, uh, the, the systems thinker, uh, one of the originals who was the only one that put fairness and justice uh, as a matter mm. uh, in family systems. And so he believed that the, that the, uh, if a system that was too unfair and too unjust um, would create kids that in a revolving ledger would make society pay for the sins of the parents. Um, mm. And that holds really true in the way that we operate. Yeah. Uh, wow. uh, and insecure attachment in some way follows that uh, unfairness, mm. having to wow. give having to give up my independence to have a secure base or to give up a secure base uh, because I'm supposed to be independent. Ooh, that's good. Yeah. So you talk about the idea that partners are in each other's care. And I'm wondering about, shouldn't the, each partner instead care for themselves first? Well, that's, we think that way, don't we? Um, uh -huh. in, in our field, um, we're like every like every other aspect of of call of modern culture. Our sciences are influenced by the times, and uh, and there was a time in the seventies where we reacted to uh, behavioralism and we reacted to uh, a psychoanalytic theory and decided, um, you know, we got to think more independently. We're too mm -hmm. much uh, unconscious or too, uh, you know, uh, undifferentiated. Mm -hmm. And the language was I and me and you, right? No longer we or us. Mm -hmm. uh, there was a distinct period. And we're still coming out of that of self-made person. And it's all about me. And uh, I don't need anybody. And that, of course, is not true. So we overcorrect. Yes. <laughs> uh, yeah. And now we're coming back to this idea of interdependence that we are, we are that creature. Mm. Oh, wow. Okay, but self care and self love is important. Yes, absolutely. Okay. Gotcha. But it's intertwined with other love. Mm -hmm. um, so, so when we're talking about uh, empathy, learning how to get along with another person, learning how to mm -hmm. be cooperative, collaborative, learning about ourselves is intertwined with learning about another person. So, uh, we don't, we don't come out of the womb loving ourselves we don't even know what that means mm -hmm. so that's all done externally first and 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 through life in some way it does come externally our mm -hmm. self-esteem you know waxes and wanes depend depending on our relationships right uh, and so so th they're not they're not isolated it's not like you have to love yourself first it's not that's not how the sequence goes interesting I learned so how, to love myself as I learned to love you, which is how it starts in infancy. Ah, so then when we enter into a new relationship with somebody, we need to, I feel like, um, like almost change our thinking about that other person. Like in the first, of course, the honeymoon phase, the first, what is it? Nine months when we have that hormone cocktail could going long, on could, in the brain. Could be longer. Yeah. Yeah. But it's like, that's all we think about is the other person, right? Like, it's like, we are like other focus. Is that true? Would you say that's true? Like, yes, I think the same way we would be with a baby or uh, anything that we're becoming attached to mm -hmm. the attachment system, we, we mistake for being love, but it really isn't. It, uh, it, it can bring about feelings of love, but the attachment system is, is a biological um, a function that's built into us to uh, the glue that holds us together and keeps us from uh, from not pair bonding, from not sticking around to raise a child, um, uh, from not uh, you know getting together in groups to protect ourselves as a unit uh, mm -hmm. and to prosper as a unit. Right. So all of that's really important, 
The only problem with nature's glue uh, is that we also can't quit each other once we're in a relationship and we may not make the best decisions. Mm. Right? Yeah. So it cuts both ways, like all of nature. Yeah, it's it's a good thing, and yet it's also a problematic thing, especially for us clinicians, because how do we how do we help people out when they really shouldn't be in this agreed upon union, right? Uh, yeah, I can't quit you. Then I can't quit you. Yeah. Oh, okay. So in one direction I wanted to go. You just opened oh, something else. Sorry. No, keep going. No, keep sorry, going. But 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 the the point is is that we are I believe interdependent creatures, and any denial of that I think is denial. Mm -hmm. uh, we we don't do anything alone very well. Mm -hmm. We we need other people in so many different ways, um, in profound ways, and um, and couples is just one of those situations where there there is a a dependency need that emerges in these relationships only not in other unions like businesses or anything we don't mm. have that issue so the 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 romantic couple is is unique and and more difficult because of that i think interesting so what happens then after the you know that quote unquote, honeymoon phase, the hormone cocktail starts to fade after however long, nine months a year, however long it's different yeah. for everybody. Um, and let's say, yeah. And then, you know, it's like, we get more invested again, we get more invested in our friends or, or children that we've had or jobs or whatever. It's like the focus gets taken off of our beloved, right. In some way. Um, how do we keep that other person? Like what needs to change? What tell us a little bit about what happens and what needs to change? I How do we our, need to see it in a different way? Our our awareness that um, that anything new is, is going to be old very soon because of of a a principle of energy conservation, which is to take novelty and to turn it into procedural memory of ordinary daily life. Mm -hmm. So that's that's how we operate. Um, we learn new things and then we relegate that new. Th thing or things that we are learning to automation, to mm -hmm. cheap memory that allows us to do our day without thinking. So we're basically automatic creatures operating by memory all day. Mm -hmm. And our partner's part of that memory. And mm -hmm. we'll take that person for granted. We stop looking, we stop being present and attentive. And so we drift, right? The mind is looking, the brain is looking for something mm. else that's novel and uh, something else that uh, that needs to be worked on uh, because our brain, especially the neocortex, loves novelty. And so uh, we have to understand that the only remedy to automation, which is what we're all going to do, is presence and attention. There is no way around it, that we we have to build things in that ensure that we earn love, earn respect. Otherwise, we won't. Mm. And, you know, naturally we'll pair bond nature will want us to procreate we'll stick around for four years mm -hmm. and then go and mix up the gene pool that's if we were left to our own devices right and we didn't have a culture we didn't have religion we didn't have expectations mm. so um so i i think that's 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 a way out is uh, building in rituals building in things principles that keep us uh connected throughout the day I think it's something you do, otherwise you'll just lull into a pattern of le leading separate lives. And then before you know it, uh, uh, like kids are out of the house and we're back together again. And who are you? Yeah. Yes. Oh my gosh. That's a whole other. Okay. You're, you're making my brain get confused because oh, I'm like, gosh, I have five questions right now. Sorry. Hold on. I want to ask you this first. And this actually goes, goes along with that. Cause that, this happens. I've heard this for years and years and years, you know, the kids leave the nest and all of a sudden now you're looking at that person that you've lived with for 20 years. Like, wait, really? who are you? Do I even yeah. like you anymore? Okay. But <clears throat> in addition to that, I've had this question over the years of having a private practice, which is what happens when you have a partner that does not want to, and you, 
sit with you, talk with you about what's going on. And, you know, so if you and I are, are in a relationship and I'm saying, Stan, you know, let's, uh, let's talk about what we're feeling or can we start spending an hour a week together and just connecting? And, and you say to me, why, what's the matter? We're fine. You know, and you don't want to do that. How do we address that? If we're the partner that's saying, but I want to connect with you more. I want to know, what are you feeling? And we're reaching and that partner just either doesn't know how they're not interested, they're uncomfortable. How, what do you say to those people? Uh, that's hard, isn't it? I know, right? Because yeah. um, th some of that, some of that discussion should have happened a long time ago. Right. Um, but here we are. Mm -hmm. And so better now than never. I, I think in, in the book, what I'm trying to say is, is one very important way to do this is to, you know, build this thing now for going forward. Mm -hmm. So if, if we had a system where you and I re-upped, you know, every few years, we gave each other performance reviews and, uh, <laughs> and we decided, okay, uh, this needs to improve and this needs to improve. We need this, right? Um, and, uh, you know, I just decided for this next, for this next contract series, um, I don't think you meet the, uh, the criteria for where I'm going. <laughs> Um, so, uh, love you, but I think this is where we part ways. Uh, and if we had that, then, you know, we won't, but, uh, but we might think differently mm -hmm. about not where we've been, but where are we going? Because mm -hmm. life is in the present is in the present and, and or how we're imagining it going yeah. forward. Uh, we too often live in the past and don't watch where we're going. Mm -hmm. So this good time is ever to say, do we both want a relationship um, uh, where we are in contact with each other during the day and that we feel tethered, you know, mm -hmm. that'd be a good thing. Would, is that attractive to you? The other person says, no, it's not. Um, yeah. Okay. Um, then let's reevaluate why we're doing this. Um, okay. What is the, what is our purpose going forward? I think we sh shifted our purpose from being a couple long time ago to being just parents. So we're a couple again. What's our purpose? Why are we doing this? So there are ways of having, I think, conversations to find out, is your partner interested in being alive and being vital and to think about what's next, mm -hmm. right? Or are they just yeah. solo sport? And people have to realize that it's possible that they've been living with uh, a potential deal breaker. Mm. Which is, maybe that's why we spend all our time focusing on the kids because we never had a purpose as a couple. I find that um, actually mostly it's women that have asked me that question, but I actually just spoke with a man the other day who was asking me this, this exact right. question. Like my wife won't talk to me. You know, when I bring it up, she says, stop talking to me. And um and uh, and she gets triggered. Yeah. And what do you mean you want to, you know, but mostly it's, it's, it's been women over the years that have asked me this exact question. Like my husband will not talk to me. He gets angry when I ask him, what are you feeling? What do you mean? I don't want to go there. Why are you bringing up, you know, emotions? So I typically recommend like, well, you need to, you kind of need a third party. You know, a lot of times we need a third party to come in and just be that person that comes in and says, do you see what's happening, you know, and really work with both couple, both, both people. Would you agree? Think, and, yeah, yeah, I would, I would. Cause yeah. we do, we do go into threes when dealing with uh, getting married, mm -hmm. um, yeah. uh, even, even being brought together and dating in the free, there's a third party. Mm -hmm. um, uh, and so why wouldn't there be a third party also in brokering the future? Yeah. Yeah, yeah for sure. Something that you um, have taught me a lot about over the years has been something called quick repair. Yeah. Tell us uh, what is this all about and um, why is it important? So, it, it, you know, everything I talk about isn't about politeness, isn't about, mm -hmm. you know, niceties. It's all tactical. It's all strategic. Mm -hmm. Same with quick repair. The reason we want to repair quickly is because of threat because our mind isn't Disneyland and when we are uh, stewing and, and, uh, and mm -hmm. simmering and, and, uh, you know, uh, kind of sitting in our corner, right. Mm -hmm. uh, away from our partner, we're suffering. And that, uh, that experience, the longer we wait before we 
get relief is uh, it will go into long-term memory. Yeah. That's because of the production of adrenaline and, and adrenal fluids that uh, helps form long-term memory, right? So, mm -hmm. so, uh, so it has a practical thing. If you don't want, if we don't want to remember a bad thing that happened, it would make sense. You and I fix it right away. We won't remember it. Mm -hmm. So on a memory level, that's really good. Mm -hmm. On a health level, um, uh, it's also very important because the attachment bond that I was just talking about is an existential biological matter of survival. So if you and I aren't doing well, uh, we had a disagreement, uh, there's, we're likely to carry some awareness that the, re the relationship may no not exist anymore. Mm -hmm. And that's an existential threat to us. So uh, the longer we uh, go through that, the more wear and tear on our brain and body. So there's a, a real physiological danger there in terms of getting sick and uh, longevity and all that stuff. So that's a bummer. That's terrible. Mm -hmm. um, and our relationship gets more threatening um, mm. because in my mind, I'm practicing everything. You're not here to correct it. And so I'm going to practice my own my own suffering, my own uh, being, uh, you know, uh, treated badly, um, that doesn't just go away very well by itself. So there's no upside to uh, taking longer than an hour. Okay, right. that that was what I wanted you to talk about. So oh, sorry. <laughs> so did, no, 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 no. So how do you do it? Because, um, you know, when, when a couple has an argument, um, everyone is different. You know, some yeah. people want to talk about it immediately and you might have one partner that wants to talk about it immediately. And the other person needs to wall off. Um, yeah. you might know a couple <laughs> or well, two that yeah, does this, you know, that sounds great. like, uh, like a yeah. lot, a lot, a lot, a lot of couples, yeah, and, but it's different for so many reasons. Like for me and for Graham and I have to say, um, when we have, any sort of argument, small or, or larger, you know, I need a moment to process. And it's not that I'm stonewalling him by any means. I just need, I just need a little bit of time to not only feel my emotions and let them metabolize through me, but to be able to articulate what I'm feeling and what I'm thinking. I just need, a, I need some time Yeah. where Graham, what, but what I've learned is if I don't at the least, and you've taught me this, if I don't at the least go to him and say, listen, I need a moment. I need some time to process feelings, to think through my thoughts. Da, 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 da. I'll be back with you in a day, an hour, whatever it is, just to say <laughs> that I just, you know, it depends on how big hunting it is. And gathering and all yes. Like that. I need to, like, I just need, I need some time. Like I can't talk about it immediately, but just to, and I used to just go into this, like, it, it's it, again, it, it's not stonewalling. It's just like, I'm in process mode. I'm in yeah. deep process mode. But I wouldn't say anything. I would just get quiet. Well, that would send him into outer orbit. Like, oh my God, are you leaving me? You know, and then he goes into awfulizing with his thoughts and makes up stories. But what I've learned to do now is to say, hey, I just need a minute. I need an hour. Let's talk at lunch today. And then he settles himself down and everything that happens that you talk about in the brain, it's so yeah. helpful. Um, you, you, you can also say, if if you if you wish, um, you can say, you know what, I'm, I'm mad, yes, but we're okay. It's the we're okay that I think settles us down. Totally. Um, because that's the part of our brain that wonders if mommy dies, I die. If this yes. is over, I'm dead. Um, am I dead? Am I not dead? Uh, and and just that, that's why um, Tracy and I have had this thing, if we can go to bed, excuse me, we can go to bed angry, but we have to at least touch to toes, yes. excuse me, keep burping. Yeah. Yeah, it's um, okay. um, it's the it's the uh, it's the touching that is a an unquiv unequivocal message that we're okay. Yeah, that's why we just calm down. We don't have to settle anything. We don't have to fix anything necessarily. We we really just need that. So you could also do that too. That's that's really what everybody wants to know. Are you okay? Yeah, Grandma said that to me. He's like. <laughs> You didn't even touch my toes at night. I'm like, because I oh. was angry. <laughs> I'm like, so now I will take my toes and I will touch his toes, even if I'm like, not that I'm ever raging mad when I'm going to bed because I went. You'll do feel that better. Night. You'll feel better, by the way. Yeah, I'll to touch his better. toes and I'm like, I'm still in process, but here are my toes. You know, that's what I'm thinking. Here you go. And I, he I does. Went to the 
I went through yeah. the same thing uh, <laughs> where I, you know, I don't think so. I don't think but, I want to do that right now. I, yeah. No, but the takeaway I think is that when we are in an argument with our beloved, yeah. it's so important to give them something yeah. while we are in process and don't take a week or two no. to then come back. Right. Which I mean, <laughs> I know people that have done that too. You know, I've done that for days sometimes. And this is the old me, of course, but before I had these tools, but I realized the importance of I'm not in a good place. I will yeah. be back in touch with you. And I like what you just said, like, you're okay. Like everything's okay. Or what was your, what was your statement? Um, uh, we're okay. I, I, yeah, we're okay. Yeah, we're okay. That does settle down the nervous system. And then it's like, okay. But I think it's important to say, I'll be back with you like tomorrow, or I'll be back with you. Like there needs to be a time when we can connect, reconnect and reattach. It seems like that's important. So thank you for that. It'll be good for you too, by the way, this whole thing of we're okay uh, is settling your system as well. Not just mm, your body. that's good. Yeah. It's, it's, this is an existential issue for all of us. Oh, that's really good. So talk about what's the pepper tool. <laughs> pepper. So, um, um, uh, Alison, Howe, my, uh, dear colleague friend, um, came up with this. We were doing a retreat in, in Tuscany and, um, she came up with this acronym, uh, of pepper and, uh, <laughs> and o over time, uh, it's been reworked and reworked to now where it is, is uh, 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 predict, plan, and prepare mm. uh, for anything that's coming up uh, and revise as necessary or repair as necessary. So um, so let's say we're going to go on a vacation and we imagine, okay, we're going to have a great time, you and I, and um, that's where we're pointing, that's where we're ending up, we're going to high five each other at the end. And that's how we're envisioning our trip. Now we think about what could go wrong. And, and we go through the list of predicting each other, how we could get into a fight, mm -hmm. and, then, and then eliminating the dangers there. Okay, how about if we do this to keep that from happening? And if I do this, you do this. Or if you do this, I'll do this. How about that? Well, sound mm -hmm. good? Okay, so all of this is planning to make sure that we meet our vision right we're gonna we're gonna have a great time so <laughs> then we go down what okay what about uh you know drunk uncle harry or what about uh the they're bringing their dog uh you know what what do we do if this happens how are we going to handle them politically so that we're good but we don't do anything to hurt anybody by protecting ourselves right mm -hmm. so if, if possible so we just th this is this is a kind of you and i against the world we're plotting planning how to meet the future by by using the gift that God gave us, which is to be able to predict and plan and prepare, mm, right? Mm -hmm. um, you and I even have a plan for if something happens we couldn't have expected, we'll meet in the bathroom and and reconvene and come up with a new plan, oh, so okay. that our so that we're a team. That's the whole thing. We're not just waiting for the same things to happen again and again. Mm, that's so good. Yeah. What, what, um, what is secure functioning and why is it so hard to do? Secure functioning is, isn't about, about attachment actually. Um, uh, so I'm big on attachment as, as well, but mm -hmm. this is, this is social contract theory. This is mm. uh, the idea that any union in a free society that's getting together based on a shared mission and a shared uh, vision idea of why we're doing this, not love, right? Um, uh, it has to play it a certain way in order to have both longevity and happiness, right? Mm -hmm. The only way to have longevity and happiness is to set up shop and to create a structure with a hierarchy and what we're going to do and what we're never going to do. We're basically creating our relationship ethics from scratch. Mm -hmm. Our our relationship, moral values, and uh, and we're fashioning basically our own civilization of how we're going to prosper and survive, and how we're going to protect ourselves from each other, because people Ooh. need protection from any uh, anybody, uh, because it's not about feelings; it's about having a set of purpose, meeting the criteria for what we're going to do, what we're never going to do. 
and then cooperate with each other so that we have a long lasting relationship. We're not remembering unfairness. We're not accruing resentment. Uh, we're not constantly litigating the past. Oh right? gosh. And not, and not getting anything done. Okay. That's, I just have to stop you. That's so important because so many couples bring up the past. They drag it around with them and they bring it up in fights or in conversations and they throw it in their partner's face. Yeah. I might have done that once or twice. <laughs> <laughs> well, just once or twice, Stan, you know, in the past. Um, but it, it really, it's about being conscious not to do that. And carrying that, cr it's crap. It's carrying that crap around doesn't serve us as couples. Well, it goes back to repair. Yeah. Because anything that repeats is causing inflammation in the person who is mm. in stress because I'm, I'm not getting any relief. And, and, and this goes back to infancy, you know, mm -hmm. with a, a very uh, early, uh, I'm, I'm feeling um, that you're doing something and you're not paying attention you're not listening. You're not responding to my cries, my pleas for relief. And you continue to do it. I get louder. I get louder. I start to spread the content of my my discontent <laughs> yeah. um, um you know it gets bigger because i cannot get you to stop and so that's why we end up with this long-term memory that gets reanimated every time i experience something like you did and that's why it sounds like you never forget right well it's because you never fixed it and you're still doing it right yeah. and that's why so we have to understand how memory works. We have to understand this whole idea that the quick repair actually saves us downstream um, mm. because we don't want to keep building up inflammation. It spreads like it does in cells in the body. Mm. And so, so it's just the smart thing to do is to fix things now um, so that we don't end up spending all of our time really in the junkyard. Uh, not living life, but sorting out everything we did wrong. Yeah. You know, it doesn't, it doesn't make sense. We know this, but, but the moment is too seductive. You know, I know this, but I'm going to, I'm going to feel better at the cost right now of doing the right thing. I just, it's so important to come up with. And I think the last time you were on the show last August, we, you were talking in your last book about this, which is like, do you come up with a set of rules that yeah. you follow as a couple, it's just yeah. rules that you follow, but I don't think you're, that it's, it's you know, your ethical, it's your culture. It's, it's your ethical framework. That's, yeah. that's, if we're a couple, it's hours and hours alone, right? And we're constantly yeah. shaping. So when I just want people to understand that it's not rules, it's that one person made up. No, and it's together. Both coming together. Yeah. Yeah. It's like, when we decide to enter into a relationship with someone, we all need that book of yours. It's like a relationship Bible. Like you need to read this thing to understand how to have a, it's not even, I mean, yes, it's loving, but it's a successful relationship. Nobody really talks about this. You know, we just jump right in because we're in love. Well, that changes so quickly. You've got to have this framework where how to have a long-term successful relationship. And that's what I love about all of your work. Cause that's what you teach so well. If you love and I it. don't, if, if you and I don't create, co-create something from scratch and, and continue to mold it like clay, we're going to fall back on our family of origin. We're going to fall back yeah. on the culture we grew up with and I'm going to do it my way. You're going to do it your way. And yeah. we're not going to be happy. Yeah. Cause it's not ours, right? Yeah. Together. It's mine. And we'll just automatically, mindlessly do what we know. Yeah. And, you know, yeah, you get married and then you become a parent and then you retire and then you die. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> that's, what uh, I saw. that's what I saw. I don't expect anything else. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. Um, oh my gosh. I have some more. I have a few questions for you before we end here. Um, what do you do? You know, we talked about... Um, what we were just talking about, I want to ask you about not carrying the past into the present day. What do you do as far as building up trust after there's been deceit or cheating in a relationship? Boy, that's, that's the tough those, one, right? Those are, how's those that are for two a small, different. Yeah. How's that for a small little question, Stan? <laughs> um, 
Yeah. What, what, one is what a general question yeah. about memory coming into the present. Yeah. Again, uh, memory, um, you know, the past is present. <clears throat> yeah. So the way our, our minds work, since we're, uh, we're memory animals, the past is, is present. That's why it feels like we're dragging all that along. What we make a mistake is not like Norman Lear said, the, uh, the secret to happiness, know the difference between what's done and what's next. Mm -hmm. Um, mm -hmm. we spend too much time on what's done we don't think of how to correct it next and then going into the future that would take care of that yes yeah. so that's in the general right yeah but with betrayal boy we can we could be here a long time i, I know take up a whole hour on that at least um yeah. the, the, which kind of betrayal are you talking about because there's many kinds there's the worst kind and then they then there's others Betrayal in, and I, yeah, I'm thinking of a few different kinds as you say that. Um, number one, let's just go with, you know, there has been infidelity. Yeah. Okay. You know. So infidelity, um, and I, I like to broaden the idea of infidelity. Yeah. To not simply mean sex or affairs, but infidelity to our agreements, our principles. Mm -hmm. That's a bigger problem, right? Mm -hmm. If mm -hmm. we don't have any, then we default to sex. Um, mm -hmm. so, uh, the main problem with most issues around affairs, cheating is the lying. So the cheating, of course, um, is a betrayal and is a shock to the system, mm -hmm. but it's, it's the misuse of, of shared information. It is the, the, I did not, I did not allow you a choice to decide to get off this boat um, by saying, I, you know, I, I'm going to go out and I, I would like to have, a, you know, a, another sexual relationship where I want to become polyamory or I'm not sure I want to be married anymore to you, mm -hmm. um, you know, to allow you to be part of a process. Instead, I cut you out and deny you the ability to make a decision based on valuable information that you should know. I cut you out, and that's what does the biggest damage. Mm. Biggest damage is um, I uh, is the reveal of information that if I had known would have changed everything for me. That causes PTSD. That causes mm. uh, mayhem, and and that's most devastating kind. Mm -hmm. So that could be an affair. That could be an offshore account. That could be I have actually two other families. Sorry to tell you. Um, mm. I, you know, I, I'm actually 20 years older than I said I was. <laughs> Anything that radically changes your understanding of what we are and what we've been doing and mm -hmm. right yeah. is going to throw you for a loop for a very long loop. Mm -hmm. And that's, that's the problem, which is why I say the free flow of information in partnership mm -hmm. is one of the greatest commodities mm -hmm. that in order to do business, you and I have to have the same information. And in order to be in charge of everyone and everything, we have to have the same information. And as primary attachment figures, we feel entitled and uh, that we have a right to have this information. And when we don't, it's a big shock, right? Um, you left me out of that information. You decided unilaterally that I didn't need to know this. I did. And so it, it, it is a devastating uh, re, you know, reveal discovery that usually brings us about and uh, devastating and very hard for couples to repair. They have to really see a clinician that understands how to put this together properly mm -hmm. so that it doesn't happen again. It's a very rigorous, painful. Yeah. Uh, I would think we year. can't do it alone. Like you can't do this alone. You need help. Would you say that you, like you said, you have to bring in a, a clinician to yeah. repair. You know. There's a reason for it. And the reason is that we're all, we all want to get out of suffering as soon as we can. Mm -hmm. and, um, and partners in a, in a betrayal like that are in, are in consistent, constant pain mm -hmm. for different reasons, for different yeah. reasons. Um, but it's very hard to bear and, uh, and, and very hard to find reason to have to bear it. Like mm -hmm. if I, if I'm the discovery partner, you've, you've, completely blown it with me this is treason i have no idea who you are anymore i have no way of knowing what's the truth that's the situation i'm in mm -hmm. um, i have no why why do i want to do this well the attachment system 
the I can't quit you biology. Mm, right? wow. Tells me there are a lot of, there's a lot of moving parts here. We have kids, we have a house, we have financial interests. <clears throat> all, while all those are true, there is still that part of me that believes, you know, if, if this ends, I die. Right. Wow. There's just a, a, there's just that dread yeah. of, I, I can't quit you still. So that's good. Mm -hmm. If that's what's holding you together, I can work with that mm -hmm. and uh, and leverage that towards a secure functioning relationship. That's the good news. And, and have you been hearing, um, you mentioned something here, polygamy, monogamy, and you mentioned that in your book, I think, as well. Yeah. I remember yeah. reading that. Um, are you hearing that there's more and more of that? Or what are you, what are you hearing in your practice? I'm I'm not. I Because we didn't carry a lot of stats in terms of all okay. these alternative lifestyles, mm -hmm. um, it was mostly, um, you know, uh, a thing that people would would reveal, um, usually to people within their community and people who were tolerant of that kind of lifestyle. So mm -hmm. that makes sense. So it's hard to know whether um, it's it's a consistent population that's interested in consensual non-monogamy mm -hmm. uh, or polyamory or Mm -hmm. any other varieties of relationships, right? Because just like our sense of sexuality has expanded, mm -hmm. I think we're more, we're all thinking more gender fluid today as yeah. being a more realistic term mm -hmm. than any other time. I think the same is happening with lifestyles, right? To each his own. Yeah. Um, everybody yeah. has a different way of, of, of determining what is happy for them, what they want to do. So we want to catch up with that sensibility because we, I think I've been guilty as a lot of other couple experts thinking only dyadically, right? Thinking of only heteronormative uh, couplings and so on. And um, I've become very aware and very sensitized to, uh, to how many people are excluded from that, that lifestyle. And then mm -hmm. well, what about us? I mean, you know, how come nobody's writing to include us? Yeah. And I'm guilty of that. And so I'm just now beginning to reimagine, reconfigure in my head, how does attachment as a biology work out in these other lifestyles? Because unless I can understand it myself, I can't articulate it well enough. So mm -hmm. I'm in process with that. Uh, and I'm writing about it. Mm. Because I, I I think I think science and I think the social sciences are are not as inclusive as not nearly as they need to be, mm -hmm. and, mm -hmm. um, and so yeah. Mm. Are you including open marriages or open relationships? I should say in that, not just yeah, marriages. absolutely. Yeah. Uh, yeah. I, I mean, this is not you know I I don't want to be um, uh, I'm trying to stay away from being somebody who says this is how it should be. Mm -hmm. I'm trying to say the opposite. I'm trying to say, do whatever you want, as long as you both agree. Yeah. And you yeah. can do any kind of relationship you want. I don't care. I, um, if, if you can, if you can imagine it and you both want it, do it. Um, just make sure you're both on board. That's all. Just make sure you think it through um, yeah. that you, you adult and, and you're doing it in a way that will be fair and just and sensitive. And that can work. You yeah. have to, Right. So, yeah. It, it goes back to open, honest, raw communication, whether you're no matter what kind of relationship that you're in. Right. No matter so, what. This will help. Here's an example, if I might. Mm -hmm. uh, so uh, so I had a, a couple once and um, they um, decided they didn't want to get married. Uh, they didn't believe in it. Not that it's a religion, but they just didn't. Mm -hmm. And they, they wanted to uh, to defy sort of some of the social norms. And so they, uh, they've they had a very stable relationship, uh, regardless. Um, and uh, and they wanted it to be consensual non-monogamy. So they were free to have sex with anybody they wanted. Mm -hmm. And then as they went through time, there were more um, additions to, you know, but, but tell me first, right? Don't tell me afterward, right? Mm -hmm. So it, it kept changing until it got to the point where one of them got into their 40s, which is a midlife. Mm -hmm. um, and in midlife, we know we get uh, certain changes in the brain and biology. All mammals go through midlife depression. We re reevaluate things. 
And this, this one who in their 40s uh, s- s- started to protest and said, uh, well, I haven't been doing it um, by choice, but we're still free to do it. We're still free to do it. That's I'm not changing the rules. We're still non-monogamous. But if you loved me, you wouldn't do it. Oh. Now that's that's not secure functioning. That's insecure functioning, right? Mm-hmm. That's that's not mm-hmm. a social contract. That's that's uh, uh, very confusing. And yeah, and uh, I understand why that person did that. They just didn't want to let go of their ideology. Yeah wanted to bend reality in order to to make it fit their need right mm-hmm, uh, mm-hmm. yeah i'm not going to say no we we are free to do whatever we want it's just again if you really cared about me you, you wouldn't do it oh yeah, yeah no. so so that's that's the difference yeah you know Interesting. Um, your adults your legislators you decide what this is don't play games with that mm-hmm. interesting you have time for one more question Sure. Okay. Finally waking up. Okay, good. I know it's it's really early for you. Sorry. <laughs> You're in no sleep. All right, here we go. It's a whopper. Uh-oh. <laughs> um, so what do you say to somebody? I, I'm thinking about all the secure functioning, se- secure attachment, and how we have such a hard time because of the secure functioning and our secure attachment of letting go when things are not going well in the relationship. So whether like it be, when to stop or letting go, yeah, like uh, what do you say to somebody that's in a relationship that really is an unhealthy, uh, abusive uh, relationship? And there's, it's almost like, and I'm thinking of the clients that I've worked with and the people I've worked with, even since I haven't been seeing clients over the last few years, it's like, we feel it's, it's almost like this feeling of, I, I have to stay, Yeah. you know, and, and I'm wondering, is it because of that secure functioning, like, or, or secure attachment? Like this is, this is all I know, even though it's unhealthy, what do you say to these people that are in this sort of relationship and they don't feel like they have options. Out. This, but this is probably the hardest, one yeah. of the hardest things that couple therapists, uh, I'll speak for myself, hardest things I have to deal with. Mm-hmm. Um, it is, um, you know, from the outside, it seems so clear, right? From an outsider, from uh, yeah. a spectator. Yeah. Um, but this whole thing about I can't quit you isn't a rational uh, drive. Um, mm-hmm. and, and, and but it is powerful as hell. Mm-hmm. Uh, and some people are afraid that they can't do better. Some people are afraid that they need the other person for their lot their, to be able to survive. Um, people feel trapped in their situation. So there are real, it's not simply this, I can't quit you. There are real things. Yeah. I'm just saying the, I can't quit you biology could complicate things because it, it, it may keep somebody from trying to figure out how to, t- how to make this okay mm-hmm. um, <clears throat> for themselves by, by garnering support, people that love them, um, uh, that are able to think about how to extricate themselves um, but that's a whole other problem because a lot of people in the situation are under resourced, yeah, uh, and they don't want to tell anybody. So this is a, you're right. This is a very complicated area, mm-hmm. um, uh, and uh, and very very hard as a uh, as a witness to to see this and be powerless, mm-hmm. really powerless, yeah, because a therapist <clears throat> doesn't have any leverage Mm-mm. here. Um, uh, you know, there by the grace of God go I, uh, this is not my, I'm not living that particular problem. So the best we can do is, is, um, is to support embolden, um, the person who believes they're trapped, uh, and scaffold them in, uh, in terms of, of reality to support that part of them that's in reality mm-hmm. to, in the hopes of, of getting them to, to do something that's best for them, even though it's the hardest thing to do. That's really what we're talking about. Yeah. Doing what's best, um, even though nothing about it seems good. 
Mm -hmm. <laughs> you know, no direction mm -hmm. seems good, but there is one that is still is better than the other. Right? Yeah, There's thank you one for that. Better than the other. And it's very hard for people to think through when they're in that existential threat. Well, when they're living in fight or flight, you can't think straight. I mean, the, that straight. that executive functioning part of the brain isn't even online. So how in the world? Well, even, in, world? even, yeah. even, in, even in between when they're not yeah. in fight or flight, even in between, I think that, uh, that it becomes so overwhelming that it's hard to think. You just said something. I can't, I don't remember the whole sentence for you or the whole comment you made, but uh, you said that they, I think you said something like the word that stuck out for me was they believe they believe yeah that they yeah. are yeah. stuck, can't get out, whatever it was. They believe that. And then you also said, you know, when we're on the outside looking in, whether it be friend, family, as a therapist, as a coach, whatever, it's like so obvious to us looking yeah. into the situation. Right. But when mm -hmm. we're in, in the middle of it, ooh. It's a whole different story. So it, yeah. it is. I'm, you know, I, I think people are always doing their best. Yeah, um, I agree. Um, our, our best uh, is hampered many times by uh, the nature of being human mm -hmm. and our situation. Um, and so uh, the thing, these people I worry about the most are the, are those that are isolated couples that are isolated um, I, I think of them as potentially folly ado couples. And if, if your audience doesn't know what that means, folly ado is, uh, is as, as a two person madness, mm -hmm. right? We pull each other down into madness because just like isolates that are, you know, individuals that go off into the woods uh, tend to go crazy because they don't have any interaction. They don't have any reality testing support of other people. And we know what loneliness mm. does. We know what isolation does. Mm -hmm. it, we, get, we get crazier and crazier until we put tinfoil in the windows and write a manifesto. Mm -hmm. That's a function of loneliness. Yeah. So couples can be lonely too, isolate, isolated like, uh, you know, George and Martha from one, uh, from um, uh, Who's Afraid of Virginia Woolf is a, is, is a classic mm -hmm. folly do couple, right? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, and so I worry about that with any couple, but a lot where there's abuse, a lot yeah. of them probably do, or, or potentially that, you know, they're, they're definitely isolated. They're not, they're not talking with other people. It, it seems to me that these couples that, uh, you know, the, one is the abuser and then the victim of the abuse or um, is needing help with self-worth because it's, they don't, you know, they, they don't know who they are. They feel completely unworthy. Um, would you agree with that? Or what, what can they work on? If someone's yes. listening and they're thinking, this is me, wow, this sounds a lot like me. What what do you recommend? That's so one I don't, thing, I, I, I don't want to, I don't, on. I don't want to organize the fact that, that we pick each other based on recognition and familiarity. And so they picked each other. <clears throat> Why did they pick each other? Right. There's a his, history here of recognition. Mm -hmm. uh, that's also the bite that fits everyone's wound, right? I have the bite for we, you and I, Mary. I'm definitely going to have the bite that fits you, your wound. Mm -hmm. You're going to have the bite that fits mine. It's, mm -hmm. it's nature builds this and it's weird. Uh, <clears throat> and so, so there's that, that I'm locked into a relationship that also tells me how to feel about myself. Mm -hmm. I'm playing a role in that. I picked a partner who's going to play a role in that. And we're both doing reenacting things together. So we can't forget that. Um, but also that, um, uh, that oh, I forgot my train of thought, it, 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 that there's, there's something about the helplessness mm -hmm. and the hopelessness of, of, of doing the right thing, right? My self-esteem gets injured every time I do the wrong thing. Uh, but I did it because I, I needed to feel better right now. Mm. Right. So that's a little bit like an addiction, right? I need mm -hmm. to do something that relieves my pain, even though doing that is going to cause me more problems. Mm -hmm. I'm not thinking that way. And so I'm weakening, literally weakening that, that part of my brain that would tell me not the best thing to do. Think downstream, mm -hmm. <laughs> like, mm -hmm. you know, that don't be penny wise, pound foolish. Don't just take the immediacy of a relief even though it's going to set me up for more hurt. Every time I do that, and as a kind of a foodie addict at night, um, 
uh, I know what this is, right? Mm -hmm. um, uh, I, I want to feel better now. I, I don't want to put off that relief, mm -hmm. um, uh, right? And so I'm constantly giving in uh, to, to this aspect of me that wants to feel better right now, even though it's not the right thing to do. Mm. My self-esteem goes down. Yeah. Every time I make that decision, every time I make the decision not to touch my wife's toes if I'm mad at her at night going to bed, I'm going to uh, hurt my self esteem if I don't do it. So it, ch it gets chipped away bit by bit by bit by bit. By I'm bit. doing it. Yeah, I'm doing it. very hard to say that to somebody yeah. who feels that they're uh, that they're being victimized, which they are. Right. But we have to remember that we're dealing with adults that, um, as human primates, we're warlike. Yeah. Um, uh, you know, someone who looks like they're helpless, you still don't mess with them, but we forget our size. Um, and we regress to being little and helpless. And, uh, and we don't realize that, you know, I could do damage to this person who's doing damage to me. Mm -hmm. Sometimes we do hear about that in the, in the courts, but, um, but it's, it's, it's a, uh, it's a going back, I think, to a, a way of being probably in our family of origin, mm -hmm. where we um, fold our cards. Right? Mm -hmm. That's what we do, we just continue to fold. And every time I fold my cards, I chip away at my self esteem. Because when we do the right thing, when it's the hardest thing to do, the benefit, you only know when you do it, is you feel really better, you feel good about yourself. <laughs> mm hmm. Mm -hmm. Now I, 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 yeah, I created a loss, but I, wow, look what I did. I was able to do the right thing when it was the hardest to do. There's something about that. That's that it goes in the other direction. And so again, mm -hmm. there's a lot of re it's very complicated, right? There's a lot of moving mm -hmm. parts to all of this. Mm -hmm. I, I think that's part of it too, is my decision-making to feel better at the cost of being better also hurts myself. You also said something important, which is because something that people typically say, um, how did I, why did I pick this person? Why did I do, how did I, how did this happen to me? I don't understand. You know, I tried to pick someone that didn't look like my dad and didn't, you know, I moved across country and I swore I wouldn't do it. And here it is. But it's this unconscious thing that we do where we just, like you said, we plug in, you know, our wounds are plugging into them and they're plugging into us. Doesn't matter. It's, it's, um, nature doesn't think, I, I don't, you know, I don't think this is a personal issue. Mm -hmm. uh, it feels personal, right? But I don't think it's personal. I think that there is a, a, a process of mate choice yeah. that is both psychological and biological, psychobiological, right? Mm -hmm. A lot of it's happening under the radar. Nature is doing its thing by making sure that our immune systems line up and all that mm -hmm. other stuff. There's all this stuff going on that we don't know about in made choice. But then there's other things that we're kind of aware of. And that is, you know, the alcoholic that will find the one person they want to go out with. Mm -hmm. And that's the person who's asleep in their soup, right? That's mm -hmm. an old joke. Yeah. Um, we, we pair bond by recognition because you have to be familiar enough to me to want to spend my life with you. Otherwise, you're too stranger-ish and I'm too far away from home. But if you're too familial, you're, it's kind of incest, uh, it's, right? I'm not interested in you, really, for that. Mm -hmm. So there's got to be a mix of strangerness and familial and familiarity. Mm -hmm. um, and so nature is, is not making a mistake. The problem is, is that we're picking by recognition, not our fathers or mothers. We're picking people that we, including ourselves, that we recognize. We still don't know how to handle this state that we get into with this with a person right we still don't know how to handle anger or whatever i think it's more like that mm -hmm. you know um okay. yeah i recognize you you're great i see all the good stuff and oh there's also that too that's coming with it the bloom is off the rose and now i'm dealing i'm incompetent with dealing with who else you are that i recognize right mm -hmm. so it's a competency thing mm. Because we, yeah. we don't see it when we start dating these people, you know, we don't see it. And then all we of don't a sudden, see it. yeah, it just which starts is, coming out later on. Yeah. Which is why we have a, a, a natural vetting process of taking uh, our new, newly minted or uh, our candidate 
um, parade them around to our people, you know, of different ages and different genders so they can sniff them out. Because mm -hmm. yeah. one thing our friends and family do is they also know what's familiar and what's too strange and what's uh, mm -hmm. too familiar and not strange enough. Mm -hmm. And so if people would only say, hey, tell me the truth, you know, when you see us, do you like this version of me? Do I seem like myself? Do you like this person? Mm -hmm. What do you think they're like? Mm -hmm. um, um, uh, do you see anything that bugs you? Um, I want to know this because I'm not in my right mind. Oh, of course we're not. Yeah. And yeah, pay I, attention. I mean, yeah. I right. Mean eyes and ears a bit. Yeah. Because they're not in the relationship with you. So pay attention to what people around you say. That's a big takeaway. What you just said here is when your friends and family and people say, Ooh, do you notice this? Don't get angry. Just listen. It doesn't mean you have to even take it to heart. Yeah. But when I always say if more than one person shares something like that to you, you better take, take a look. You better it's, take a look, right? It's part of the vetting process. Yes. Um, they have yeah. to fit into your your friendship culture, your family culture in some way. Yeah. Otherwise, you're going to uh, you, you're going to be cut off in some mm. from those mm. people, and that, that's not good. So no. those people say, "Oh, I don't need other people's approval. Um, just wait a few years." And see how that's going when, at uh, at family holidays and uh, right. Let's see how many people you had to give up for that. Um, so true. Yeah, that's really good. Well, I'm going to have to not ask you the next. Let me see, ten or fifteen questions. I <laughs> we need yeah, like an afternoon podcast. <laughs> oh, you're so <laughs> afternoon. Um, um, Thank can, you. can can I see one more uh, shout out for why secure functioning? Please, yes, I'd love it. First of all, it's the only system um, I and and others around me believe uh, is the only system that can actually last a lifetime. Mm -hmm. Any other system pans out as too unfair, too unjust, too insensitive, too much of the time. So that's just logical, rational. You can you can you can just understand. Everyone can understand it. But mm -hmm. the real reason is we want to lower um, interpersonal stress in these relationships. Why? Because interpersonal stress is, is a major killer, um, shortener of life, cause of mental and physical ills, um, mm -hmm. because interpersonal stress, chronic stress, causes wear and tear on all four systems of the body. And so it isn't enough to be in a relationship to uh, increase longevity and health. You have to be in a secure functioning relationship because an insecure functioning relationship by definition is uh, is a lot of interpersonal stress, which affects the health and well-being of, of everyone around, including the couple. Mm. Uh, this we've proven the kids autoimmune systems are affected by uh, by the, the way the uh, the couple is operating and how much stress they're under. So lower interpersonal stress, take threats, threat out of the game completely uh, and to know and be skillful how to do that. Mm -hmm. That's really the goal. That's really the goal. Um, uh, we know through uh, a, a longitudinal study, study, at least, but many studies, mm -hmm. that the secret, all things being equal, genetics, the secret to longevity, happiness, mental health, physical health, is the the presence of at least one secure functioning mm -hmm. relationship in your life. Otherwise, you're more exposed um, to all the illnesses of our species. Interesting. Uh, loneliness on one side. Yeah. Uh, chronic interpersonal stress on the other side. Both will kill you. You've mentioned lo loneliness a few times today. Yeah. That, that seems to be a big problem. It's uh, it's it is a mental health uh, and therefore physical health uh, uh, pandemic. Uh, it's what's happening. The, what's everywhere. happening? What? Why? Why are we? What is going on with the loneliness? What? What is? Is this is just rising like since COVID or? Yeah, I mean, I mean, the pandemic may not be accurate because there are countries where that, like in India, I don't mm -hmm. think they're they're, mm -hmm. <laughs> they're still uh, very relational. Mm -hmm. But in our country, um, there's more and more isolation. People are not uh, are not getting together as often. Yeah. But we were on that trajectory before COVID. 
Yeah, right? yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, yeah. Um, COVID was an accelerant, I think. Mm -hmm. um, other countries like Japan is is much further along that route than we are. They've been dealing with loneliness, and uh, you know their their suicide forests are are shockingly horrible. Mm -hmm. mm. ever looked into them. Their isolation, they're not face to face as much. They're not skin to skin as much. They're not having sex now a lot. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. And so there's this um, uh, this siloing that's mm -hmm. been going on in certain cultures, a trajectory. And we're one of those countries, I believe, that's on that trajectory. Uh, and that's becoming a mental health um, uh, issue. What, what, do we do, what do we need to do to change that? Um, we need people. We need to, we're interactive creatures. Um, if we don't interact, uh, the mind is in Disneyland, like I said a million times. Uh, it's why uh, uh, you know uh, solitary confinement is considered cruel and unusual punishment. Yeah, so true. It's That's torture. so true. Yeah, yeah. It's torture. And we go crazy. So, like you go crazy. You can't. Yes. But you know, you, with with these things, is this is this why <laughs> the cell phone? But even <laughs> Zoom, you know, I, I mean, this is not, does having a Zoom meeting help with loneliness or a FaceTime call? It's not I, enough, is it? I, I, I'm out of my wheelhouse to say. Yeah. Uh, I don't know. I suspect just in my own feeling, how I feel when I see couples in person as opposed to on telehealth, I yeah. feel better being in person. Me too. I agree. Um, I feel lazier and more and, and my, my laziness is gratified this way. Yeah. My avoidance is gratified this way, but my need for human connection isn't. So, yeah. uh, so yeah. I think our technology, um, mm -hmm. but I, I, not only our technology, but our, we're, we're busier today than ever before. We're bombard bombarded by data, um, mm -hmm. that it causes, and it's like the TV's on all day, uh, in our heads. Uh, mm -hmm. and, and we, you know, we'll see whether we can adapt to all of this stimulus without sacrificing our ability to attend, because that seems to be happening too. Right. There's more attention deficit in the adult population simply because our mm -hmm. technology and our pace, um, and how much we switch thing, uh, tasks, um, is contributing to becoming accustomed to things that are happening like this. Yeah. And no patience for long stories, no patience for slow dramas, no patience for so true. So, so we see all of this happening, and yet we're all enjoying the the toys that we get and the bright colors and all the fun things they do. Which, of course, people who produce these items understand how the, how the brain works and understands how dopamine works, and how that we're constantly um, overloading the dopamine system. Yeah. Reward throughout yeah. the day. Yeah, it's true. You know, and I'm, and I'm hearing from people that say to me, I, I'd like to come to your, you know, I do a, a, just a live event every, or I do it twice a year. And I can't tell you the number of people that have emailed in and said, I really want to come. I want to learn this adult chair, but you know what? I, I'm too anxious. I don't, I won't know anybody. I'm like, I promise you, you'll make some of the best friends you've ever had at these events. No, yeah. no, I'm too anxious. And I'm hearing that, at, 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 you know, I've been doing these events for seven years. I think more, COVID and more, more and more over the years, like I, I, it makes me nervous to be around that many people. I'm like, oh my goodness, we have so much fun. Come on. No, they're nervous. You know what happened to me? We went to the Spain retreat last uh, year. Uh, we put on a, a couple's retreat in Spain Yeah, and I was shocked. I coming out of COVID first time doing this and I used to do it regularly. I was shocked how shy I felt. I went back to my old mm. shyness yeah. and feeling uh, like I didn't want to be around that many people. Wow. And I was afraid. I mean, it really yeah. was surprising. I had yeah. to really warm up again because um, of, of the effects of quarantining, you yeah. know, yeah, uh, I wasn't accustomed to, you know, to being out there anymore. Yeah. So I think we need to start taking some, and this sounds like the wrong word, but risks of just being or inviting people over for dinner mm -hmm. or out to yeah. coffee or go to lunch. And, you know, it's not, not to say you have to be around a hundred people, but start, start, you know, taking that risk and be brave and start connecting yeah. more. We need in-person connection. 
Yeah. I, I'm not somebody who wants to be in big crowds, especially right now. Yeah. Yeah. No, me neither. <laughs> yeah. I, you know, whatever. I, I was, I was in the, well, you know, yeah. this. I was in the yeah. emergency room last yeah. night and I was sitting there and for the first time I became aware that somebody could come up and shoot the place. Yeah. You know? I never yeah. thought about this. Oh my God. So, I, I've talked to more people that keep saying this to me. I, I had the same thought. Yeah. I had the, I'm starting that that thought. It must be in our collective con con consciousness. Because, be? um, I mean, I had the thought like, oh, I got to run down to the mall. And I literally, my next thought was like, wait, the wait mall. is that safe? I was like, well, I had to go return something. I'm like, well, I can do it at the mall instead of email or mailing it back. And I thought, but wait, that's not safe. Like that was my thought that drifted into my brain. I'm like, oh God. So talk about we... loneliness. This thing is, this whole lot thought is going to create more loneliness if we're not careful, right? There, well, I, I think this is a, a loop, right? A loop of yeah. anxiety and fear and avoidance. Yeah, which gives rise to more anxiety, fear, and avoidance, right? Yeah, so, yeah. Uh, so, I, yeah, I, you know, we we we're yeah. an adaptive species. We, yeah, we seem to find our way. Yeah, uh, that's what I'm going to trust. Yeah, <laughs> we do. Thank goodness. Yeah. You know that we find our way, <laughs> but but you're right. Um, there's ways to get together with people in very small groups in your own safe room, mm -hmm. if you wish, uh, where you can still, you know, meet and greet and get together. Uh, it's yeah. really, it's really important. Yeah. Yeah. So we, I think we just need to be more intentional about that and, and push through our fear and just do it. Have someone over for dinner Agreed. in your home. Yeah. And just wear your Kevlar. Yeah. <laughs> Stand. You'll be in fashion someday. Yeah. <laughs> This is, this was so wonderful. Thank you. Thank oh, you. Thank, thank you. you. Thanks for, oh gosh, you've done, I mean, so much research um, throughout all these years. Thank you for what you're doing. Cause it's, gosh, it's, it's incredible. Um, well, the, okay. The, the, yeah. Yes. And, and, and uh, I, you know, I, I consider myself, um, uh, you know, what I do in my practice and what I do, the, the clinical research I do in my practice but uh, but I don't I'm not a researcher in the sense that I do original science uh, uh, that mm -hmm. uh, I'm a clinician first uh, and the clinical research I do uh, has been added to that joy. Yeah, and I, I mean uh, I mean everything you just you reference so much as you speak like oh yeah well this and this and in your book so I really just appreciate your your dedication to. Mm -hmm. The human species. We can just say that because <laughs> holy moly, your I, wealth I, of information. I, and I have a selfish interest. Yeah. <laughs> well, I love it. And your work is just phenomenal. So tell Thank people in, in just in case someone doesn't know who you are, how would they find you? What do you have coming up? What are you offering outside of this book in each other's care? Everyone does uh, need to buy this. It's such a, you know, the, the chapter that I love too was fighting do's and don'ts. I mean, that's so good. The, everything's so good. It was such a quick read because um, it's so darn good. So anyway, Thank how do you. people find you? Um, um, th go to uh, the PACT, P-A-C-T, the PACT Institute.com. There you will find uh, information if you're a clinician in the mental health field. We train therapists uh, all over the world uh, on this kind of very complicated polytheoretical approach to couple therapy. Mm -hmm. But we also, Tracy and I, my partner, my life, my part, life partner, my wife, my, I love my wife. Um, uh, uh, we do couples workshops online uh, throughout the year and we do couple retreats mm -hmm. uh, uh, in places like Spain and next year, Portugal, which hopefully you're coming to. Oh, I'm and, coming to that one. I'm, just, uh, I'm telling you right now, I'll be there. Yeah. <laughs> And I'm now working on the revision, the, the uh, second edition of Wired for Love. Ooh, so good. That's that such now. a good one. And I can also attest that the eight-week course that you, it's well, it's not eight consecutive weeks, but the eight-week intensive that you can do with your beloved and you and Tracy is phenomenal. Again, I think anyone that is in relationship with anyone needs to sign up and take that. They will reap so many benefits from your work and those those eight weeks. What is it like two and a half hours every yeah. every yeah, week two, for two eight and a half weeks? Hours, yeah, loads just of amazing. videos and, and study materials, and then we do things, uh, and people can be as anonymous as they would like. Yeah, uh, 
because uh, you're working together basically in a group but oh my gosh it was so so good so i highly rec recommend that and we will put all of this information in the show notes Thank so you. people can continue to find you and sign up for all this good stuff that you're offering and of course is your book available on amazon and everywhere everywhere yeah and awesome. this time i actually uh, did the audio uh, <gasps> too, did you so read it i did oh i love that oh good it was fun I, I, I love was, audio I was, books. Those I was, are my I was writing favorite. it. I, I thought it would sound like I was reading, but uh, yeah. actually it was so much fun. I thought, yeah, in my second career, I could just read books. <laughs> you have a great voice for that too. So, <laughs> well, thank you so much, Stan. We All appreciate right, you being well. here today. Always a pleasure. Thank you. All right. There you have it. Hope you all enjoyed the show. Let me know how you like the show. You know, I love to read your comments. Hit me up on any sort of social media, but also... Spotify. I've been reading you guys. I know you guys are listening over there and I like your comments. Thank you. Also Apple and anywhere else, I do read the comments. So I appreciate you guys leaving comments and letting us know how you like the show. And also it helps other people to find the show as well. So thank you. Thank you. Thank you. All right, you guys, I will see you next week, June 1st, right here in the adult chair. <laughs>